Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I'm the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. If you'd like to stop by and visit us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. We gather at 10 a.m. for our Sunday morning worship. You can also get here an hour early at 9 for Bible study next week. And you can find us later today at 4 p.m. for another worship service in the afternoon. Also on Wednesday nights at 7 for the other installment of our Bible studies. I encourage you to check it out. We have classes for all ages. You can get in touch with us at River Ridge by phone at 812-550-6234 or you can send an email to info at riverridgechurch.org and we would love to hear from you. Today we're going to talk about a problem and we'll begin in James chapter 3 with verses 1 and 2. James 3 verses 1 and 2. James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Pretty much every day I have this passage in mind because of my job. It's definitely a burden that weighs on me. I have to think not only about the decisions that I make for myself or the conclusions that I reach and the ways that, that I decide to implement what I'm reading in here, but also the fact that I am now relaying that and presenting it to other people. And if I make a mistake, it's not just me who stands to reap the, the, the consequences. It's other people who are listening to what I have to say. Now, it's not as if Every teacher is always responsible for every single person who listens to what he has to say. James himself was misrepresented at times. Let's look at an example of that. I'm turning to Acts chapter 15, and while I'm on my way, I'll give you some uh, background information. Of course, the Apostle Peter had been the first one to preach the gospel to Gentiles at God's specific direction. And time goes on. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, they go out on a missionary journey. They end up teaching the gospel to a, a lot of Gentiles. And when they come back, back, they discovered that, well, trouble has been brewing, and there's a, a an argument about whether or not, basically, whether Gentiles need to become Jews in order to reap the benefits of Christ. So, this discussion takes place between uh, Paul and Barnabas on one side and this, uh, let's say, circumcision party on the other side that is pushing the law of Moses on Gentile converts, and the elders and apostles in Jerusalem are gathered to consider this question. So let's pick up in Acts 15, verse 12, after Peter has had his say. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. James said this. Same James who we were reading in, uh, in, in James 3 saying, Not many of you should become teachers because we will be judged with greater strictness. And James, who says this, who says the Gentiles do not need to become Jews in order to be Christians, is misrepresented. Even though James and Paul are on the same page on this matter, in, G in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, we read, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James... He was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Paul means that these men seemed to come from James, or that they seemed to speak for him. But in reality, that just wasn't the case. Go back to Acts chapter 15, which actually happened a little later. And in chapter 15, verse 24, the letter that the apostles and elders send to Gentile Christians says, Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. 
These people did not come from James. They were not actually speaking for him, but that's how everybody looked at it at the time, despite the fact that James held a completely different and correct position. There's always potential for real problems in the church, either through misunderstandings like this one or mistakes, like in Peter's case here in, uh, in, in Galatians 2, where we read that Peter, who knew better, was still falling into this old, tired problem of treating the Gentiles like they're not really Christians. Speaking of Peter, Acts chapters 1 through 12 basically follows Peter's work. And then in uh, Galatians chapter 2, earlier in the chapter, verse 7, Paul says, on the contrary, when they saw that I, Paul, had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, that is, the Jews, and, you know, we're not completing the sentence, but the, the point here is that in Paul's estimation, God has sent him to preach the gospel to Gentiles, primarily, and that he had sent Peter to preach the gospel to Jews, primarily. Okay, now combine this with his outspoken character, Peter's, and Jesus' reliance on him in, in a passage like uh, Matthew chapter 16, where beginning in verse 17, we read, Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, it's easy to see why Peter's role was elevated in many people's minds. Now, we should note, even though Jesus is pointing out that Peter's going to have an exceptional role in Christ's kingdom, verse 21 of the same chapter, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's not like Peter could just make stuff up and go his own way against Christ. He's still serving Jesus. Now, in Acts, I said chapters 1 through 12 basically focus on Peter, and after that, the focus shifts over to Paul. And the rest of the book follows Paul through several missions. And then as you read on in the New Testament, we read 13 of Paul's letters. He contributed more material, at least by the number of works, than any other New Testament author. He's behind Luke as far as volume of words is concerned. He offers us the closest thing that we find in the whole Bible to systematic theology in his letter to the Christians at Rome. It's understandable then that this stuff, that, that Paul's work gets put front and center as the faithful seek to better understand God. But also, well, the systematic theology portion of Romans wasn't really the point exactly. Otherwise, chapters 9 through 11 on the situation of Israel in this whole scheme between Jews and Gentiles wouldn't be there. After the apostles died out, time went on and the church went on. And there were other prominent figures who were elevated, at least in many people's minds, above their peers. So we could mention Clement of Rome. He's actually apparently mentioned in Philippians 4.3, and he wrote quite a few letters and was held in high regard. We could mention Ignatius of Antioch, who was apparently an associate of Matthew and Luke, who left his own writings. We could mention Marcion, or Marcion, he's sometimes called. Uh, he was also prominent, and he held an opinion that the Old Testament was garbage, the God of the Old Testament was false, and that the New Testament was a bit smaller than what we have in this book today. Yet he also had people who deferred to him and held him up in high regard. We could mention a guy like Tertullian, who was likewise very prominent. I mean, he was mostly right on, on, on the majority of issues. He was way off on some things like the nature of the Trinity and on Montanism. What's Montanism? Well, <laughs> we get into another guy, Montanus, who was also held in high regard by some. And he made himself and two ladies out to be the heads of... Um, well, some cult cultic weirdness that was not actually Christian at all, despite wearing Christianity as an outer skin, let's say. Yeah, that was a problem. We could mention Origen, who did some really good work on the nature of Christ. 
there's also some weirdness in his ideas about the parity or the equivalency, let's say, between God and Satan that are highly sketchy to say the least. We could talk about Arius, who held that the Son of God was created by the Father God. And, well, that's a bit of a problem based on some things that this book here says, and it's a problem that is still with us in some circles of Christian thought. We could talk about Athanasius, who was majorly divisive, and he stood against Arianism, which is to his credit. He's also credibly accused of engaging in all kinds of horribly immoral behaviors, including murder, in order to get and maintain his power and profit in the church. So that's not a good look. We could talk about Donatus, who led the opposition to reinstating and reaccepting church leaders who had denied Christ under pressure in order to avoid further persecution. We could talk about Augustine of Hippo, who was another major thought leader held in high regard by many, and perhaps justly so. He was a writer, and his, his main thing was to try to strip away a lot of the sort of newfangled nonsense and get back to Christianity as Christ established it. Was he right about everything? How likely do you think that is? I mean, the guy wrote like a hundred books, probably going to find some falsehoods in there. We could mention Nestorius, who was another guy held in high regard, and he also brought about another schism in the church over an argument about the nature of Christ, which seems like it keeps coming up. His followers either all turned against him eventually and denounced his ideas, or those who uh, continued to adhere to his doctrines left and went to the East and ended up as part of the, let's call it the Eastern Church. There are many, many, many more names here that I'm leaving out, but those are at least most of the big ones. Now, this only brings us up to about like the 5th century AD, and around that time, most of this sort of thing kind of cleared up and, and settled down for several centuries. Of course, the, the politics continued, and there was lots of political and, and social and societal change over those centuries, but... There weren't very many notable leaders of Christian thought with names that are somewhat widely recognized today until you get to someone like Francis of Assisi or Thomas Aquinas in the 12th and 13th centuries. And then, not so long after that, you've got names like John Wycliffe, who, uh, well, he was, he was, let's call him the, the earliest to try to publish an English Bible. He didn't get all that far. He was considered a heretic. We get to a guy like Jan Hus, who was kind of doing the same thing farther east in Europe. We could talk about Martin Luther, there's a name I'm sure you recognize, who had, well, let's call them some major disagreements with the Catholic establishment. He succeeded in publishing a Bible in the vernacular, although it was in German rather than English. We could mention Huldrych Zwingli, who mostly gets uh, ignored, even though he was one of the most prominent Reformation leaders. I really think that much of that comes down to the fact that his name is impossible to pronounce. <laughs> but he was the leader of both the church and the state in, well, let's call it Switzerland. We could talk about Menno Simons, who was the, uh, the, the, the forerunner of the, the modern Mennonites. We could get their name from Menno. Uh, a, a similar Reformation leader who was held in high regard, obviously, by many people, still has a following of people who, uh, like the Lutherans, bear his name today. And we could mention William Tyndall, another English guy who was trying in vain to publish a, a complete Bible in English and lost his life for doing so. We could talk about John Calvin in, in France, who was another major Reformation leader. We can't trace a, uh, a specific denomination of Christian thought that, uh, that directly follows on him, but, well, let's say several prominent traditions would trace their thinking and theology back to Calvin. Was he right about everything? Of course not. None of these guys were. We could mention John Knox in the, the, the Church of Scotland, which was still in the process of separating from Catholicism in the Church of England, and he's the forerunner of uh, modern the modern Presbyterian denomination. And 
well, sub-denominations. After that, things, again, more or less settled down until the modern liberal philosophy takes hold and rebellious Americans swear off any and all established religious authority at the same time as they are swearing off any established political authority. Did they have reasons for doing both of these? Of course. Did they go about it in the right way? Eh, that's subject to debate, and how you see it depends to a great extent on where you sit. There are far too many examples here, and many more that I have neglected to in include, examples of what I'll call the Corinthian problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Any time you find yourself appealing generically to what some guy says, you have a problem. If I ask you what's your position on the interrelation between Christ's divine and human natures, it's fine to say, I don't know. It's not the end of the world if you say, well, it seems to me, it's much better to say, well, such and such a passage of scripture says, where we really have a problem is if your answer is whatever so-and-so says about it, referring to some preacher. Now, it's rare that I hear someone actually say that, but are you thinking it? Now, it's not the same as, I wonder what so-and-so's take on this would be. And that's fine within limits. As Paul said, these are servants through whom you believed, and therefore they deserve some respect and appreciation, as Paul himself says many times. But they don't deserve your servile devotion. Let's shift gears briefly. Some Christians object to art that depicts Jesus on the grounds that it is idolatry. Is it? Well, not necessarily. You can differentiate a depiction from the actual image of God. And God, who maintains throughout the Bible that he has never been seen by human eyes, also gives, in some cases, to the very same servants that he tasks with telling the world that he is invisible, visual depictions of himself in visions for them to share with the world. He does this to Moses, he does this to John, he does this to Isaiah, and so on and so forth. The trouble comes when someone begins to confuse the image with God himself. That usually shows up as treating the image as if it were sacred, as if it bore some religious significance, using it in your worship, that sort of thing. Something similar happens with preachers. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. God explicitly says here that a preacher, Moses, represents him. And so as God, God is obviously God, and Moses is his prophet, Moses stands in for God. And so it's as if you could look at Moses, who is in the place of God, and even he has an intermediary who represents him, Aaron, his brother, who then tells his messages to Pharaoh. And therefore, by extension, Aaron is also a mouthpiece for God. Preachers do represent God in a similar fashion to the fashion in which an artwork can visually represent God. But don't begin to confuse the representation or the representative for the one he represents. God is infallible. I'm not. God is all-powerful. I'm not. God is all-wise. I am not. God is all righteous. I am not. One of the reasons that it's such a scandal when a supposedly faithful minister of Christ is caught cheating on his wife or something like that is that we start to believe that they're perfect and, and usually their public behavior is at least significantly better than average. So their followers give them the benefit of the doubt and they give them an immense degree of trust. And then when something 
unambiguously evil becomes undeniable, then the whole system of belief comes crashing down because you made the mistake of putting your trust in a flawed human being. Remember Peter in Galatians 2? Part of the problem was that he stood for God, that he was a representative of God, and others were looking at the example that he was setting and they were following it. Yet even Peter, the apostle, sinned. We are all of us works in progress. Sometimes the preacher's grip on his followers becomes so strong that he can get away with saying anything, any nonsense, without losing the trust and obedience of his followers. Sometimes it gets so strong that he can get away with horrible behavior without losing their trust and obedience. At that point, they are usually not just followers, but victims. You ever notice that it seems like in, in all of the fanatic religious cults, the leader always gets to sleep with all the women? <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. It's like the most reliable common thread through all of these fanatical cults. Well, we certainly don't want to go down that road. That's obviously wrong. And yet people are deluded because they confuse the mouthpiece. They confuse the representative with the one that he purports to represent. They make him into a messiah. That's no good. And it's obvious when it goes to that extreme that it's terrible and we don't want to go down that road. So what do we do instead? Let's turn to Acts 17. The middle of verse 1. They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. And saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So far, so good. Paul and Silas show up in town. They speak the message that God has given to them, and they're gaining some traction. Verse 5. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Yikes, that escalated quickly. Now let's just note for a moment, the people responsible for, for instigating this mob scene are Jewish. And the reason that they give before the city authorities is that they're concerned about undermining Caesar? Are you buying that? I'm certainly not. Devotion to Caesar? They looked at him as a pagan interloper who was putting himself in the place of God and standing in the way of God's plans to have the Messiah reign from Zion. They didn't recognize the Messiah when he came, and they didn't recognize his reign as evidenced right here. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Now that is a much better approach. They're not taking for granted that whatever these guys say must be true. Instead, they are examining it against the word of God in order to determine, hmm, maybe this is true and maybe it's false, but God's word is going to be the final word on the matter. It's fitting that after being chased away from Thessalonica and the region so soon, Paul soon afterward wrote back to these same Christians in that region we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Now, he means materially there, but there's a spiritual application to that concept as well. We are supposed to have our own faith, not just what our parents taught us, not just what is currently fashionable or what is politically or financially advantageous. It's not supposed to be faith in Paul or in Peter or in Apollos or in any of the, the many servants through the ages who did a lot of good work and also made a lot of mistakes. 
We should make use of their labor. We should appreciate them. We should stand on their shoulders. But our trust is supposed to be in Jesus. As Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, we should still show respect and gratitude to these human ministers, but you need to open this book and read it for yourself. I don't want you to listen to Jeremy. I want you to listen to God. And if I'm mistaken about something, I don't want you blindly following me. And by the way, I want to know where I'm wrong, because I'm sure that I am mistaken about some things. Tell me about it. What I don't want you to tell me, though, is, but my preacher says, because who cares? I've got years worth of books sitting right here behind me and many more that you can't see in my office. Perhaps decades worth of reading material full of men's ideas. And I have read a lot of them in the past. Frankly, I don't get that much time to read many of them these days because I am too busy reading this book. 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's where our focus should be. Do you need Calvin's Institutes to explain more clearly what Jesus and Paul have to tell us? Well, then I guess everyone who lived before the 16th century was doomed to hell and never had a chance, those, those poor people. Or maybe you wouldn't go that far, but would go a little earlier to Augustine's City of God. Well, in that case, same goes for the people who lived before the 5th century. Now, Augustine and uh, Calvin and many others have plenty of worthwhile insights to share. Absolutely. But which set of writings leads to salvation? Augustine of Hippo? John Calvin? Martin Luther? Tertullian? Origen? Or God's? But, but just listen to what so-and-so has to say. I don't have time to track down every set of man's ideas and then judge them on their merits. It's just not worth it to me, frankly, because I'm too busy listening to what God has to say and then trying my best to faithfully relate that to other people. Ecclesiastes 12, beginning in verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. If you need to change your approach toward God and his word and to find a church whose lead pastor, the one shepherd, is Christ instead of some guy, then I encourage you to reach out to us at River Ridge. You can get in touch by phone at 812-550-6234 or email us at info at riverridgechurch.org. You can also find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh for Sunday morning worship at 10. I hope to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.